salvation so full and free and last week we did a whole hymn we're just gonna do a piece of one this time is that all right just a snippet you know what I'm saying a piece of paper just a small piece of it yes the Lord hallelujah song says thank you Lord for saving my soul yeah Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for being the great God, the great I am who is present in this place. Allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in this place as the word of God is chatted about, Lord God, and that you are lifted up and exalted in our lives, Lord God, that we learn, Lord God, what we need to learn, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for those who couldn't be here today, Lord God. We pray that you're with them, Lord God, that you keep them and sustain them, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for those who are here, Lord God. We pray for those, Lord God, who are mourning the loss of loved ones, Lord God. Give them strength and encouragement, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for those who can celebrate, Lord God, the freedom that we have in you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the relationships, Lord God, that we have the ability to share your love and your compassion, Lord God. 
We thank you, Lord God, that we can be free to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in this country, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that we are bold and courageous, Lord God, to share this salvation free, full, and clear, Lord God. We thank you for our pastor, Lord God, as you bring him forth, Lord God, to chat with uh, Ms. Dickerson, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that it be fruitful, Lord God, and that we may learn what we need to learn, that our lives, Lord God, will be purposeful, Lord God, that we live out our calling and our purpose, that you might get the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening, everybody. Good evening to those who are, who are worshiping with us online tonight. Welcome to Unscripted. This is our third week of our conversation on uh, the possibility for personal fulfillment. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, and so I'm glad that y'all are here. I think it's really important that we be here tonight. Uh, and I'm going to get into that uh, in just a minute. But um, let me make sure that you say good, good evening to somebody that uh, you don't know, somebody that... Uh, that you didn't come with, you didn't ride in the car with, just say good evening to somebody real quick. Just say good evening. If you are online, I want to encourage you to do the same. I see all of y'all that are online tonight and want to encourage you uh, to engage with us from wherever you are connecting with us from. Um, and, and tonight I'm going to do something uh, in a little bit more of assertive fashion than I normally do. If you are online, I want to encourage you to share this conversation tonight um, from whatever platform it is that you're on. It's just find a little arrow, hit the little arrow, share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your followers, all the folk that you are online with. Uh, because I think tonight's conversation is, is a really important conversation in light of the fact that it is Juneteenth. Uh, and so uh, part of what it is that has us in this conversation about personal fulfillment is the desire to ensure that we are applying and overlapping our faith with our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day -day walk. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a really powerful conversation tonight, and I want to make sure that we share with whoever it is uh, that might be blessed by it uh, and learn something new, all right? Uh, one thing I do want you to know, uh, just by way of announcement, um, on this coming Saturday, right, so tonight we're talking about public policy and politics. On Saturday, we're going to be talking and celebrating the Academy and our very first Academy graduation. We got eight folks that have completed the first phase of uh, biblical training here at New Bethel at the Academy. And so we're going to be celebrating them. And so I want you all to come and be present for that. We're not going to stream that on Saturday. It's going to be in person. We're going to celebrate folks who have gone through... Old Testament and New Testament and the, the teachings and the sayings of Jesus uh, and who have been trained in biblical knowledge because, you know, one of the things that I'm discovering these days is that uh, we we a little bit lacking in our biblical literacy, a little bit lacking in our biblical literacy, but it is extremely important, particularly if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, to know what it is that you believe so that you can articulate that. All right, so we want to invite you to come to celebrate those uh, who have completed that course. And then maybe it will inspire you to come and to be present. It'll be at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning uh, right here uh, at New Bethel, 1739 9th Street Northwest. All right. If you are new to New Bethel, text the word guest, text guest to 202-798-8927. Text guest to 202-798-8927. That way you can be posted on all the things that are coming through. You can have all the information uh, about events that are coming up and be able to register right straight from our B Blast. All right? So, so tonight it, it, is, it is Juneteenth. And I, I want to, before we jump into our conversation with our special guest tonight, I want to share two scriptures with you. Two scriptures with you, right? Because one of the things that we um, value greatly uh, here at New Bethel is biblical teaching. That's one of our values. So I want to uh, uh, encourage you to, to pull up on your device or if you've got a hard copy Bible, uh, turn to Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. And then we're going to take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. All right, Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9, and then 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. All right, I'm going to read those 
uh, for you. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. That's Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Amen. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So we know Proverbs is in the what testament? Old Testament. And we know 1 Timothy is in the... So we got, we got some scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that speaks to a responsibility that we have to be advocates and intercessors on behalf of those who are oppressed. And so Proverbs says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And then once we get to that New Testament scripture in 1 Timothy, Paul says, um, we, need, we need to make sure that uh, prayers and petitions and intercession and thanksgiving is made for all people so that those in authority can know that they are to make sure that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. So, so I want to suggest that these two scriptures are, are, are important and that they work together because at the end of the day, as sons and daughters of God, God desires that we live in liberty, that we live in the freedom that God makes possible, and that there is a role and responsibility that those in authority have to make sure that that happens. And when those in authority and great high places don't make sure that happens, guess what? We got a responsibility to make sure that we speak truth to power. And so here we are on Juneteenth. And uh, on, uh, in 1863, uh, there was the Emancipation Proclamation. But how many of y'all know that not all the people were freed? Right? And so there was a Union general who made his way to Galveston, Texas, and let people know there some two years after the Emancipation Proclamation that they had actually been freed. There's a woman whose name is Opal Lee, who is known as the grandmother of Juneteenth, right? This, this holiday that we celebrate today, who made it her mission to make sure that the, 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 the true story of Juneteenth be told. And, and so she literally walked two and a half miles every day. And then in September of 2016, she began a track from Texas to Washington, D.C. to make sure that this mission uh, of recognition of, of Juneteenth and this story is known and heard in the form of a national holiday. That's why we celebrate Juneteenth. That's why we have it. Here's what's interesting. Opal Lee was not a uh, community advocate uh, for her the entirety of her life. She was a teacher. She was a teacher. And... Um, this teacher made it her business uh, to have impact beyond the classroom, beyond her students, in a way that has impact for all of our lives. And so we thank God for Opal Lee. We thank God for uh, those who have struggled and fought in order that we can have freedom, even as we are still trying to get free. And we thank God for those who serve in public spaces and in public policy to make sure that this advocacy for those who are oppressed and those who are underrepresented and those whose voices are not heard are, are represented in these rooms and at the table. And so that's how, what has us where we are tonight. So y'all know we've been having conversations with folks who are students and athletes um, in corporate and professional spaces. Tonight, our guest uh, is one who serves in this public policy and, I, and dare I say uh, political area. Although she is not a politician, uh, she serves and works and often engages with those who are 
on behalf of those whose voices are not heard and on behalf of those who are looking and needing support as they serve literally across the nation. So I'm not going to give you all a whole big introduction of her. I'm going to let her introduce herself as we go through this conversation. I need you all to help me welcome to the stage uh, a card-carrying member of New Bethel Church, Phyllis Dickerson. Y'all clap for her. So, um, we have a seat right here, uh, Sister Phyllis, and uh, for those who are online, I'm going to do my best to watch, and y'all know if y'all got questions, y'all can just um, make your way to the microphone, actually, even as we're having a conversation tonight. Is that all right? And that way, we can sort of keep the conversation uh, rolling and moving, uh, and I'll try to catch those of you who are online who have questions. If you want to just ch uh, type them in the box, I think I'm on Facebook. Um, Y'all can go ahead and try to do that, and I will try to capture your questions, and we'll include you in the conversation just as well. So, Sister Phyllis Dickerson, um, share with us, tell us who Phyllis Dickerson is. Tell us about Sister Phyllis Dickerson. So, first, thank you for inviting me today, even though I kind of feel at home because it is my church, right? Um, Card-carrying so, member. <laughs> so, I'm Phyllis Dickerson. I'm originally from Little Rock. I moved to D.C. three years ago to take a position as CEO for the African American Mayors Association. We represent over 500 black mayors around the U.S., including 50% of the top 20 cities in the U.S. And of the top four cities by population, three of them have black mayors. That is New York, L.A., and Chicago. Last year, we finally lost um, the city of Houston. So last year, we ran an article in the New York Times called The Big Four because we actually, for the first time ever in history, the top four cities were represented by black mayors. We advocate for policy on the Hill. We do training and sharing of best practices. Our youngest mayor is actually 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so Jalen Smith out of Earl, Arkansas, actually won office when he was 18 years old. And we laugh at Jalen because he didn't even tell his parents he was going to go uh, sign up to run for mayor. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And Jason, Jalen still lives at home and has to do chores. So it was amazing <laughs> that, uh, that he signed up to run for mayor without even um, conf uh, confirming it with his parents first. Yeah. Um, so in addition to all of that, I want you to share with folks a little bit about your background pre-AAMA. Uh, so, of course, I told you I grew up in Little Rock. I graduated from the notorious Little Rock Central High, where you hear about the Little Rock Nine. Um, and so, in doing that, I lived, I came from a single parent home. My mother was in government. My grandparents lived in the house with us. So, I had the tea cakes, the frappe, the, all the things that your grandmother cooks when you, when you grow up in the South. And um, afterwards, I went to college. I'm, I'm a little, I'm about to date myself. I went to undergrad with Scotty Pippen. So Scotty was one of my classmates from undergrad. I knew six two Scotty Pippins and six eight. He actually <laughs> grew six inches between his sophomore and junior year. And I was like, did your mother take you to the doctor? But anyway, then went to grad school. I'm a Delta, for those of you who are in Greek organizations in the audience. Thank you, Masora. And um, I spent 20 years in fashion. So I worked for Neiman Marcus, Gap Corporation. I used to open up Gap O Navy stores across the U.S. So after 20 years in fashion, I decided, I think I'm burnt out. I started looking at everybody like they were a thief, so I knew it was time for me to go. And um, actually started doing some contract work. But one of the biggest projects I did was the Clinton Library opening. And I saw this guy do something that I had never seen before because my area was hotels for the library opening. And this guy kept coming in the door saying, oh, the president's not doing that. He's going to do this, this, and this. And I was like, who is he? And they said, oh, that's Hale. And I said, Hale? They said, not H-E-L-L-H-A-L-E. -L -L -E. And so Hale, and I said, what is he doing? And he, they said, he's a lead advance. And I said, oh, well, I want to do what he's doing. And they said, Phyllis, you got to pass the background check. And I'm like, well, I got an 845 credit score to be able to pass the background check, right? I didn't know what was entailed at the time. And so um, after the library opening, which poured down rain for those of you who were not there, you didn't miss anything uh, because we were drenched. But I got to see Hale do a job that I had never seen before. 
And so afterwards, I asked about the position. They started letting me do advance for President Clinton. And so every, at first it started off every time he came to Little Rock, and then it moved from when he was, to what he was on the road. And you fast forward, then it was time for Hillary to run for president the first time. And I said, I think I want to go on the road and work for Hillary. And they said, Phyllis, Hillary's not like President Clinton. I'm like, okay. I think I'll be fine. I'll survive, right? And so I got to work for Hillary for two years in her first campaign on the road, um, which is like doing advance on steroids. It, it really needs to be a reality show. And after it was done, I, um, I didn't have closure for some reason. So I told the Lord, I said, for some reason, I don't have closure. I'm one of those people that loses the game and gets up, and I don't care, right? And the Lord spoke to me and said, the only way you learn how to work for a first lady is to work for a former first lady. And I said, Lord, am I going to go work for Michelle Obama? And he did not answer. <laughs> and so for a year, I kept telling everybody, everybody I met, I said, I'm going to work for Michelle Obama. I'm going to work for Michelle Obama. I'm going to work for Michelle Obama. And people, even my friends were like, are you crazy? Like you were for the other side. You're never going to work for Michelle Obama. A year later, I was coming back from Greensboro. I landed in Atlanta. I turned on my Blackberry, so that's how long ago it was. And all of a sudden, there was an email that said, Phyllis, my name is Alan Fitz, Director of Scheduling Advance for Michelle Obama. I heard you want to come work for Michelle Obama. <laughs> True story. So her first event that I did for her was in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when we did the commencement for University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, which is when the HBCUs are about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Little Rock. And after that, I went to Africa with her. I kicked off her Let's Move, her uh, military initiative. So I got to travel all over the world with her. And then later, I became the chief of staff for the former mayor of Little Rock, and then now CEO of the African American Mayors Association. So, from fashion industry to, to um, advance mm -hmm. service, I don't know what the word is for that, to Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. to the African American Marriage Association. Mm -hmm. Now, I heard you say, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord moved, the Lord did this, the Lord did that. Tell us about your faith walk throughout the course of your career in all these various different movements and industries. And, and I left out a short piece. For a short time, I also worked for Mike Bloomberg in New York. So what I realized is that we keep trying to plan our lives. And we have a responsibility, you know, going to school, getting educated, doing that part. But trust the journey. So, so I was raised in church, like in the South, you know, church is not just what we do, it's who we are. And so um, we don't know anything else. Like, I was born black, Baptist, and Democrat. Like, I didn't, I didn't know that I had choices, right? Because we were only kept in this bubble. And, and so it is, it is a journey, but it all makes sense because there are pieces of the quilt. So when I did new store openings in fashion, that was my logistics. When I did advance, that was my logistics. When I started working for the Clintons and, and the Obamas and the Bloomberg, it didn't make sense then, but it makes sense now. Because now, when I pick up the phone and I need something or I have to call somebody, I didn't realize that when I got to this position, I would do the Clinton Global Initiative. So when President Clinton invited the mayors to do Clinton Global Initiative, I walked in and the mayors were like, oh my God, we're in the room with Hillary and, and President Clinton. Phil, are you going to introduce us? I'm like, okay, whatever. And then his advanced person, they were like, Phyllis, you got it. And they started standing back, as kids say, they started standing back in a cut and made me work that night. And I'm like, I'm a guest. And they don't look at me like a guest, right? And so it made sense. And now I st still do work with Bloomberg. So it all makes sense in the end. But when you're going through the journey, you just got to trust God no matter what. And so to me, it is a faith walk. Um, and it is, it's kind of like I tell people with tithing. I don't know how you don't tithe, like, because it shows a lack of trust in God. You know, like, I was raised where I, like, like I just said, it's, it's who I am, right? And so my grandmother taught me how to tithe. I remember at first, we used to get two quarters, one for Sunday school, one for church. 
And then we got a little bit older, like elementary, then we got a dollar. And so, but 50 cent in Sunday school, 50 cent church. And then we got to be like 13, we got $5. And she said, <laughs> and we could keep two. And I was like, wow, we're going to have a lot of money, right? And then I just remember getting to $20. And so at $20 is when she taught us you only have to give 10%. And so we were like, we're going to keep $18? And so that was something new because she taught us how to give 100% at first and then how to go down to 20%. So now, or 10%, now it's, it's just like paying your light bill to me. It's, it's what I do. Mm-hmm. So... This role that you have with the African American Mayors Association, is that a role that you understand to be just another job? Or how do you process that in this great big thing called God's plan for your life? So I have to tell you how I got the job first. So, so six different people called me and they said, Phyllis, are you going to apply for it, the job? I was like, mm-mm, I'm not looking for a job. What are you talking about? And so after the sixth person called me, I was like, hmm, is the Lord trying to tell me something? So I called the recruiter and I said, Kenyatta, am I supposed to be applying for this job? And he was like, fool, send me your resume. Like I sent six people, right? So I sent in my resume. I still didn't think I was going to get a job. I thought, no offense, some skinny uh, suit-wearing attorney in D.C. was going to get the job, right? Because that's just how this position normally works. I'm not a skinny suit-wearing attorney in D.C. <laughs> for, I just want to note that for the just record. Just point of clarification. <laughs> so, so I applied for the job, and then I kind of half applied. So I sent the resume, but I didn't send the required cover letter. So Kenyatta calls me back and says, can you please send the cover letter? I'm like, okay. So 80-something people, I think something about it, like that apply. And so my, one of my girlfriends, that's an attorney in Little Rock, said, Phyllis, what are you going to do when they offer you this job? I'm like, girl, I'm not getting this job. I wasn't even worried. Like, I, I wasn't even concerned because I never, ever wanted to move to D.C. They could dwell it down to 12, and then I got the call, and they said, you made the final 12. And I'm thinking, well, who applied? And so then they dwell it down to four. And they said, Phyllis, you made the top four. And they said, now you need to present to the board. And I'm like, present what? And so they said, whatever you want to present on. I said, well, I want to present on development, fundraising. That's my bench strength, right? So I literally, from A to Z, told them everything that was wrong with the organization, from literally. And they looked in the virtual camera like a deer in headlights, like, did she just talk about us like this bad? So I just knew I wasn't getting the job then, of course. And so they called back and said, they made me an offer. I counter offered like a substantial amount that I knew that they weren't going to meet. And they said, okay. So then I went to church and cried on the altar for about an hour. <laughs> and then I said, Lord, I don't want to move to D.C. Everybody knows I don't like that he said, you know, I'm just really crying. And when I finished crying, the Lord said, get up and go pack. And so that is what I'm talking about. Like, you, even when you don't want to move, he will move you um, and take you to that next level, that next position, that next one. So it's not, believe me, it's not a job that Phyllis would have picked or moving to a place that I would have chosen. It is truly, I know that the Lord put me here. And I, I, my first year, I asked him every day, when are you going to let me leave? And it's been three years next, in, in August. So, again, if there's anybody in the house that has questions for Phyllis Dickerson, I want you to just make your way to the mic, and I want to say the same thing to those who are online, because the whole point of these conversations is to help us to see and understand how it is that God is the thread that keeps and weaves between the seasons and realities of our lives, right? This is not a Sunday proposition, this is a this is a day to day reality, um, and really the there is no separation between sacred and secular in the way that we think about our jobs versus our church lives. Um, go ahead. Let me ask you to introduce yourself so that everybody can know who you are as well. Hi, I'm Ayana. Um, I am a grad student here, well, in Virginia. Um, and the question that I have is throughout your journey and all the changes and all the opportunities that you've had, 
I know me personally, I feel like I've had a lot of setbacks or just things that kind of get in my way and obstacles. So how did you get through those setbacks or um, those moments where you're like, what's going on? Why is this happening? Um, how did you turn to God and make sure that your faith stayed in him? And also, how in the future, like looking back on it, how do those setbacks now look like setups for the next thing? So, um, you're going to make me cry in a second. So, when I was 13, I found lumps in my breasts. And so, I told my mom. She took me to the doctor. And um, they found out I had sickle cell disease on top of it. Because in 1964, they did not test for sickle cell disease. So, that was the first setback. After that, I started getting blood transfusions and that kind of thing. When I got to college, um, I dated somebody I should not have dated. And it just threw me into a tailspin so that by my junior year, I was flunking out of school. So I took a year sabbatical, and I said, um, I need to go find myself. I went to a PWI. My mom went to an HBCU. She was like, you got one year to find yourself. I only needed like 18 hours to graduate. But I cried all the way to San Diego. I moved to San Diego, and that's how I started working for Neiman's. I came back. I graduated. But when I came back, it seemed like everybody was crazy in my house. My brother was a drug addict. My sister was pregnant and 19 years old. Um, so those were setbacks for me. And then there were, there were, there were times, even in, after 20 years in fashion, my um, district manager had a sexual harassment case that I had to investigate on him. And I, and I actually ended up getting him cleared. But he got mad because, um, because I investigated him. And he terminated my employment. So another setback, right? Um, so, so every setback is for a setup. And then there was, so there was a gap where I did not have a, have a position. Even when I was telling people that I was going to work for President Clinton, I wanted to do VIP services for the president's library opening. And everybody was looking at me like I was crazy because I didn't have a job. And so I ended up having to move out of the house that I was in because I couldn't afford it. And so I go back to work. I came to City Hall. I actually came to city government not to be the mayor's chief of staff. I came to plan the 50th anniversary of the Little Rock Nine. And so it was called a limited service contract. It was an 18-month contract. And during the, the time that I took the position, I took the position in December 2005. By June of 2006, my mother died unexpectedly. Um, I was 40 years old. And, um, and I was living at somebody's house in, in one of my roommate's rooms, right? And so, but my mother left me an inheritance. And so I ended up buying my, my siblings out of their house and buying her house. Um, and it wasn't because I ever, never could afford a house. I just didn't want the responsibility. Have, my mom kept trying to sell me, just, just let me buy your house. I'm like, no, it's, it's fine. And so all, the, all along the way, even when I was the mayor's chief of staff and worked in city government, I worked in city government for uh, 14 years under three different mayors. And so even during that journey, I didn't want to work in city government. I, I grew up in city government. For those of you who are old enough in the room, I grew up, my mom was over the government cheese program. She was over welfare to work. You too young know what government cheese is. They'll tell you later. They, she was over welfare to work, the summer jobs program. Um, all the weatherization program. And so I grew up in it, but it was never of interest to me. I was in fashion because I love fashion. I hope you can tell. Um, it's, it's actually my first love. So it was a job I chose, but, but not necessarily. God just made it work in, to my advantage. And so just last week, I checked myself in the emergency room because my blood counts dropped too low for my sickle cell disease. And then just last year, I lost my sight. And I had to have four major eye surgeries to gain my sight back. My retina detached from my eye. Just, it just happened. Um, and what, a couple of weeks before that, I was in the hospital with COVID. Now, when I was in Little Rock, when COVID was happening, Governor, Governor Hutchinson's office called me and said, Phyllis, we need you to do the implementation to make sure that black people in majority minority areas get vaccinated. Never got COVID. Last year in D.C., I keep saying D.C. trying to kill me. But um, so last year I ended up with COVID. But I just didn't have COVID. I had such an extreme case that I had to be in the hospital for a week. I had body spasm. Like I shook like the movie on The Exorcist. They brought in seven doctors to look at me. And they were like, we've never seen this before. And, but, the, but the Lord sent an a advocate for me. And my female doctor that I did not know, 
she advocated. She made up a cocktail she had never made up for. And when I got released, she wrote a 23-page document that I'm sure she presented somewhere, right? And so it, it is a continuous journey. And sometimes it's not about me. It's about the people watching for them to know that when we say he's a healer, how do you know unless he healed you? Um, and so he, for me, truly is a healer because he's healed me too many times. Wow. So you, you've been through all these ups and all these downs, and you find yourself in a position where you are an influencer of influencers. And you happen to work in a space, and correct me if I'm wrong, where not everything that goes on is going to be what we used to say in school, copacetic. Right? Meaning that ethics is negotiable in some cases. I suspect more often than we realize and know. Um, here's what the scripture says. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. That's Colossians 3.23. Given the reality of some of these ethical challenges... How do you maintain your standing and standards as a believer as you are moving forward the agenda of AAMA and the people who are needing you to support them? So I have the advantage of seeing mayors come in and leave, right, for whatever reason, whether they term limited or they did something wrong. Um, and even my former mayor, I just remember one time, I can't even remember what the document was, and he was like, my, my former mayor was a county prosecutor, so he was an attorney also, and he was like, Phil, sign this, and whatever it was I read, I was like, I'm not signing that, and he was like, it's not illegal. I said, it might not be illegal, but I'm not signing it. If you think it's not illegal, you sign it, <laughs> okay? And so sometimes, you know, when I was in grad school, somebody, asked, the teacher asked us what it's is ethics, and they were, you know, all PWI again. They were like, oh, it's just doing the right thing. And I'm like, it's doing the right thing when nobody's looking, you know? And so it's easy to do the right thing when you think everybody's looking. <laughs> but what happens when nobody's looking? I, you know, I oversee multi-million dollars. Nobody checks how many times I use the credit card. You know, I, I send them the list, and they don't know what the plane ticket was for that I bought. But I know that the Lord is watching me. And so at the end of the day, I just want to be pleasing. And when I get there at the gates, I want him to say, well, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so that's where I draw the line. Because I know a lot of people um, that don't necessarily do the right thing. And I can watch. You know, when we go to conferences and stuff, most people don't know this, but the FBI has undercover agents at our conference. And so they're watching us. And so I constantly even remind um, young mayors Sometimes you don't have to take the bribe. You just got to say you'll take it, right? And so, and so what are you doing? Who are you talking to? What are you listening to? And I encourage them to bring another person in the room that's listening while they're talking mm -hmm. so that they can say, I don't think you meant to say that. I don't think you meant to say you was going to do that, right? And that's just them giving the warning bell. And yeah. so, so that's what happens. Now, I, in my heart of hearts, I, I believe black mayors matter. They grew up in our neighborhoods. They know Miss Jones. They know what the issues are because they had those same issues. They grew up in single-parent homes. They have parents that are uneducated. They have all the things. One of my fellows came the other day to ask me. She's getting an appointment, a political appointment at the um, Department of Commerce. And she said, Miss Phyllis, um, the, the background check is 134 pages now. It's the normal protocol. Like, do you print it first and kind of look over it? Or do I just go online and start filling it out? I said, right, let's just print it for you. Then she said, well, I don't have any outfits. And I said, no problems. I took her to my condo, gave her two bags of outfits. Most still had tags, unfortunately. But, but again, you know, letting her know I'm preparing you for what God has for you. Because one of the points she made was my mom doesn't have, didn't graduate from high school, so I can't explain it to her. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people get in trouble because, you know, nobody's there to be an advocate for them and watching and say, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. The, the accountability part of it. Mm -hmm. So, so then, what does what does being a Christian leader in politics, right? You know a lot of politicians. You know a lot of folks. What what does that mean? What does that 
how would you explain that or how would you um, counsel somebody as to what that means? So I have a little cousin that she, her part-time love is she, she sketches. And so many years ago, she drew a picture of this beautiful black woman. She had pretty hair, pretty eyes, a pretty, mouth, uh, pretty nose, but she didn't have a mouth. And I was like, Ashley, why does she not have a mouth? And she said, because she has no voice. And so we have to remind ourselves at the end of the day, we have been put in position for people that have no voice, mm -hmm. right? And who's advocating for those people at the end of the day? You know, my mother fired me from being a volunteer in the welfare to work program. And I was like, you do know I'm not getting paid, right? But she was an HR director also. So she looked at all the reasons for my termination. And I was like, is she kidding me? But, but again, it was, it was part of my training mm -hmm. to tell me, you know, this is how we conducted ourselves and this is what we do. Yeah. Um, any questions? Just make your way to the mic because I got lots of them. Um, <laughs> you got a question, Kev? Yep. Go right ahead. Let me ask you to stand up just so that people can see you. Just share, share your name so, so that those who don't know you. Beautiful. Good evening. I am Kevin Leroy Valentine, Jr., the whole government. Um, <laughs> my question for you is, is there anyone, when it comes to scripture, is there anyone with whom you really identify? And then do you have somewhat of a like foundational scripture or something that you really pull from? I, I don't think I heard. He, he had, it was a two-part question. Two, yep. Yeah. I can give yeah. it to you again. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So is there anyone in Scripture with whom you identify? A biblical character that you identify with. Yep. And then the second one is, what is a Scripture that you pull from? So, either when things get tough or your day-to-day -day or whatever. So let me start with my Scripture. is Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things to Christ that strengthens me. That's the Scripture that we had open in our Bible in our room in college. So me and my three roommates, that's still our scripture. Like if one of us dies, we already know what we're supposed to say at the funeral, right? Um, somebody that I pull on in scripture, I kind of have a few, like I look at Hannah and I look at how she prayed. Um, I was just talking to Damien earlier about David. Like I literally was chosen. Um, it's not anything I signed up for. And so um, those, are, those are the kind of, um, men and women in scripture that I kind of look at. Um, and, and it's so funny because God has spoken to me like in different places. I remember one Sunday I was at church in my home church in Little Rock and this couple that I had never seen before came and sat next to me. And the Lord said, give her the amount of your tithes. She's pregnant. And I'm like, she, she don't look pregnant. And so the Lord said, write her the check. So I wrote her a check, and I didn't know their name, so I wrote the check. And on the bottom where it said for, I said for the new baby. And I handed it to her, <laughs> and she burst out crying. And she said, how did you know? Because we just found out, and nobody knows. And I said, the Lord said, hand you the check. Now, fast forward, the baby is maybe, um, maybe two, year and a half, two. I'm in the mall walking, and I see all the way down the hall this black woman who I really can't see her face, and this little boy. But the little boy takes off running from her, and he starts running to me. And he jumps in my arm, and I'm thinking, why is this mother not chasing him? Who baby is this? And, and he literally, and I pick him up, and then the mother is like in awe. She is frozen in her steps. And she finally comes up to me, and she says, Phyllis, this is Gabriel, just like the angel." And I, so I had a connection with the baby in, his, in her womb that he was able to identify me when he was two. And I had never seen him but one other time between those times. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> um, could you? The, well, hold on. The, the, the foundational scripture. Well, you said 413. Uh -huh. Philippians yeah, 413. Yeah. And I thought about this after I sat down, but could you give a little insight into the significance of having some form of anchor um, in scripture, whether it's your verse or characters or stories, um, why is it important to you? So, so for me, you said insight based on the characters I chose? Or, or that... just generally like in life and in your work. Um, why is it important to have a, have 
a scriptural reference or a point of connection right, uh, right. where scripture is concerned? Because I think that in those tough times like um, the young lady asked about in those valley situations because they're going to happen, I think it's so important to have something to draw on. Um, my roommate from college and I talk every Sunday morning, and it's so funny because one of us, depending on who calls, we say, this is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> and she says, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And she grew up in Church of God in Christ, right? And, and so whatever the scripture is, we're able to finish it off. And so whether it's good measure, press down, shaking it, like whatever somebody starts off with the other person finishes it off. And so, so to me, in those tough times, we call on those scriptures. Because what I didn't tell you that um, some years ago I was at work in City Hall. And um, I had this headache that wouldn't stop. I was sensitive to light. My ear was ringing. I drove myself to the hospital, and I had an aneurysm. And, um, and so what I realized is because of my sickle cell, they couldn't operate on the aneurysm. So I'm sitting here today still with my aneurysm because they're the highlighting um, dye that they use to illuminate the space to do the surgery. Sickle cell patients have an allergic reaction to it, and they normally stop breathing. Wow. And so... I told the Lord, you have to control the end room. This is, this is your brain. You created this, right? But in the right artery of my brain, I have an aneurysm. And so, you know, when we talk about him, him being a healer, how do we know? And so those are the peaks and valleys that, that we have to trust and lean on him for. Because otherwise, we're just out here like, you know, my roommate from college and I always say, honey, we don't know how these people do it without the Lord. And I'm like, honey, you know, <laughs> and so we laugh about it. But, um, but that is that commonality that we share, that we will finish each other's verse. And then one day she paraphrased the verse. She had written it in something. And, she, and I was like, this is not the verse. And she said, well, girl, you know, I just paraphrased it. <laughs> of course, she's an AK, but no, nah, no, nah, I'm just playing. And I said, you Jeez. cannot paraphrase. The Lord don't need no help with his scripture. What are you doing? And so we laughed about it, but I made her change it. So um, let me ask you, you this question. question. Yeah, let me ask you this question. Yes. And I see you, Deke. Okay. I'm going to come to you in just a minute. Um, there are a lot of folks that serve in government roles and in city government, federal government, right? We're here in Washington, D.C. Um, and I've talked to people who get discouraged because of decisions that are made or because of things that are happening. Um, we got a, an election that's coming up in November. Um, my question is, how can Christians in government roles make a positive impact on society? Um, so first, you got to show up to vote. Um, two, you got to get involved. You got to get on city commissions, boards, whatever the case may be. But you got to show up to the city council meeting because how do you know what's going on in your city? There have been too, too many examples in Little Rock where Lord, my, my church, I told Pastor this the other day, there was a convenience store that wanted to go on the corner of our church and it was called Come and Go, C U M. Come and Go. And the church was like, uh, no. And so they showed up at the city council meeting like deep, okay? And before they could get up and talk, the city men said, yeah, I don't have to talk. We're not going to do it. But they're they not, they not going to come and build that. They didn't even get to talk, right? And so, it, and you have to know that at the end of the day, government does not have all the answers. And neither do they have all the money to do it. Because we are in a time and an era, we're seeing things happen that have never occurred before. Mm -hmm. Whether it's this whole climate change from a public safety standpoint, this whole snatch and grab, you know, the mental health issues that are happening to our children. Our kids don't want to go to school. Like, going to school was fun for us. Like, we at least showed up to hang out with our friends. They don't even want to go. Um, COVID, um, the destruction of the Key Bridge. I mean, all of the stuff that's happening right now, it has never happened before. So there is no model to go to for these mayors to say, oh, in, you know, 20 years ago when this happened and we did such and such and such and such, all this stuff is new. But so, so then how do you respond to those who say, well, it's not going to matter if I show up or if I get involved or if I don't vote or 
I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be involved in politics and policy. What is your response to those folks? Because Scripture says obey the law of the land. So there is a government component even in Scripture. Even with Scripture, you go from judges to, I mean, you, you know what I mean? Like, so there is a governance in everything we do. And so you can't make change if you're just sitting back complaining. Some of the people sitting in the pew, they have the best ideas. You know, somebody, I remember, you know, since I moved to D.C., I get to hear all the Mary and Barry stories. And so, you know, <laughs> Mary and Barry came up with the summer jobs program. But guess who came up with sponsorships for the Olympics? Tom Bradley in L.A. And guess what they told Tom at first? They said, um, we're going to do that. You're going to have to pay for this yourself at your city budget. He said, well, y'all can have it back then because he was a black man, right? And so they said, oh, it was too late to send it back out for rebid. So they had to let him do it like he wanted to do it. And so that's why you see corporate sponsorships even now in the Olympics. When you talk about... Um, Maynard Jackson, he's the one that came up with the WNBA programs, but he was Pacific. He didn't say you could be a woman and get this contract. He said you got to be black. You know, so he was very Pacific. And so you say, well, now the eyes happen. We can't do it that way. But guess what you can do as mayor? You can force the mayor to stack the eyes so that the selection committee for the B it looks, all, looks just like you. Mm -hmm. Right? And so there are ways because, you know, what I learned at the PWI, is not only do they make the rules, they work the rules to circumvent their own rule. And so you, you learn how to do that every single time. You say, well, what's the rule if you don't want to do that? And they said, oh, Phyllis, that's called limited services contract. Oh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> that kind of stuff. The, uh, yes, uh, Elder Troy. Um, given the position you're in and the ears that you have across the country, as a believer in Christ, uh, what kind of impact do you believe uh, you are having or can have in some of the things that do go on across the country in our communities? So what, what I have seen most, because I'm starting to like look like, okay, Lord, you had me meet this person, you had me doing this. But the one thing I'm seeing the most is how brown and black people are connecting internationally. So now I get a platform to speak at like climate conferences, like in, we were in Paris, we were in Nairobi. This week I met with the ambassador to Cuba, um, from Cuba to the US, right? And then last week I met with the um, staff from the embassy in Rwanda. And so what's happening is the African and what I call um, South American countries, that are black in Colombia, we went to Colombia earlier this year, are connecting. Because what we have realized is the issues are the same, mm -hmm. right, for black and brown people. But what's happening is we're not pulling our resources together yet and sharing our best practices. And so what we have to do in this new paradigm is sit down at the table together to break bread. I remember when I was in Little Rock, um, I did an event for 13 African ambassadors in Tyson. We have Tyson chicken. I don't know. What chicken do y'all have? I don't know what y'all have. But anyway. Purdue. We have Tyson <laughs> chicken. Purdue, right? They yeah. have Tyson's too. I think they have yeah, Tyson's. Tyson's. Yeah. Okay, we got Tyson's chicken. <laughs> so Tyson's is, is based in Arkansas, as you know. And I remember Tyson was trying to convince the African ambassadors to, to buy GMOs, which is genetically modified chickens, right? Yeah. And so the Ugandan ambassador looked at him and slapped his fist on the table and said, yeah. I want my chicken to have a mother and a father. Yeah. And I had never thought about it like that. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm with him, yeah. right? And, and he said, I want my chicken to have a mother and a father. You don't know enough about these GMOs yet, <laughs> right? And he was right, yes. right? Yes. So, so even though I love the U.S., right, it has not always been right, and so we have to know how to make bricks out of straw, right? We've always done it. That's where we got tea cakes from. I, I asked Pastor about tea cakes. He didn't know what I was talking about, but I'm sure somebody in the audience grew up with tea cakes. And so it was a treat for us, right? Because we had minimal resources. And so what we have, what I have learned in this journey is that I think God is taking me to some international level where we're going to bridge together black and brown communities 
and show them how to share our best practices and how we do a lot with a little. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what specific lessons would you share with us about the relationship between faith and work? What lessons have you learned about the relationship between your faith and, and your work? So, um, to me, it's just another piece of the quilt. And, um, and sometimes you don't know how, what picture God is making for you. Um, but you just got to, like I said earlier, you got to trust the journey. Because it's not going to make sense. At the end of the day, nobody is going to work and staying on the job for 30, 30 years and getting to go watch. Like, it's just not happening anymore. And so, for me, with even young people that come work for me, interns and fellows and that kind of thing, I try to, I try to dump so much information into them. And they may not understand all the why, but it's going to work out. And I'm going to give you a perfect Perfect story. So, so Thursday we were in the office, and Van Johnson is the mayor of Savannah, and he had a one-hour conversation with my fellows. And he said his father just died, and he went home. You know how you go through your stuff? Well, he found his yearbook. And during that year, they were able to emboss their name on the front of the yearbook. He wrote, and Van graduated from high school at 16. He wrote on the front of his yearbook, the Honorable Van Johnson. He said, I didn't even remember doing it. And I don't even know why I did it when I was 16. He said, but I want you to speak those things that are not as if they were. Mm -hmm. Because now he is the Honorable Van Johnson. Mm -hmm. But he did it when he was 16. Right. 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 So what advice do you have? You had a question? What, what advice do you have for someone who wants to be involved with government uh, uh, or public policy um, and hold on to their faith at the same time, hold on to their Jesus. <laughs> so it's, it's messy. It's, it's not a pretty thing. You know, the good thing about be, being from Arkansas is um, we have to learn how to play in the sandbox together because half our state or most of it is Republican. And we grow elementary school together, we went to middle school together, we went to high school together. So we sit down and we like, you know that's crazy, right? And they're like, we know that's crazy, Phyllis, but we've been making a lot of money since Trump being in office, so we got to vote for him. And I'm like, so they justified, but at least I get to say my opinion, and they get to tell me their justification, right? And so I think that you got to have thicker skin and stop letting everything rattle you. Now, what did rattle me was January 6th. And the reason it rattled me, because we're better than that as the United States, right? That's something you see in a third world country. And I just remember my friends that were working that day and they were in the building and we were calling and texting folks, are you okay? Are you at home? Are you in the building? That was a scary sight for me. And um, Benny Thompson, the congressman out of... Um, Mississippi, who ended up chairing January 6th, he was in the building, and um, they had told them to take their congressional pins off so that just in case the enemy came in to destroy them, they wouldn't be able to tell that he was a congressman or that they were congressmen or, or women. And Benny said, too many people bled and died for me to wear the pin, so if I got to die, I'm going to die with the shield on. Wow. And so you got to hold up the bloodstained banner no matter what, and we got to remember um, you know, I don't know about everybody else in the room, but, but we got a foundation. I grew up in BTYU, Vacation Bible School. You know, a lot of churches don't have this now, but, but Sunday school and, and um, you know, all the things that came along with laying that foundation. And so you got to learn how to, and that's why you got to have that scripture in your heart. So, because you're going you're gonna to have to call on it. Uh, you know, when you get in the work, you're going to have to call on it. I mean, when I go home, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is my governor. And I worked with her father. So I know she ain't as crazy as she pretended on TV because her father was a minister. So all I got to do is call out scripture to Sarah. And she can't help but react. She grew up in church just like I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so but in the camera, she may say something crazy, but behind closed doors, she's not that crazy. <laughs> she's not that crazy. <laughs> Y'all help me thank Phyllis Dickerson, <laughs> CEO of the African American Mayors Association. <laughs> Thank you.
I hope somebody has been encouraged tonight. Uh, and um, I hope somebody's been encouraged to get involved. You, you go ahead, Phyllis. Um, I hope somebody has been encouraged um, to know that there will be ups and downs to your journey no matter what. No matter where it is that God places you and no matter where it is that God has you. Um, and the fact that you might be dealing with some challenges does not mean that God is not there. In fact, it might mean that God is strengthening your character and growing your faith and maturing you in your relationship with God. So I'm grateful for you, Phyllis, and thank you for sharing and for being transparent tonight. Um, next week, we will have our last conversation. And last, next week, we're going to talk about entertainment. So I'm really excited about next week because our guests next week are going to be Elaine Janelle McIver and Tim Steele. They're going to have a conversation, and that's going to be real interesting um, given what it is that their experience has been. Um, not every musician is saved. Not, not, every, not every vocalist is. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about outside the church. I'm talking about inside the church. <laughs> I'm talking about inside the church. Um, but here's the thing, and, and a big takeaway for me tonight. You know, personal fulfillment, um, I hope we aren't confusing that with happiness. Because I think it's a lot more about purpose than it is about your satisfaction with where it is that God has you. And if you are able to be uh, an agent or an instrument of change like Opal Lee, bring it back to where we started, who is uh, the reason that we have a Juneteenth to celebrate, then God be praised. God has you in a high place somewhere where people know your name like Phyllis Dickerson, God be praised. But if you serve somewhere uh, in a space that you don't want to serve, God can be praised there too. Amen? Come on, stand with me. We're done tonight. I really want to thank you all for your presence, for your time. I hope you've been encouraged, those who are online. Those, if you desire to give, you can use all of the electronic giving portals. I thank you all for your gifts and for your generosity to this ministry and to this place. More importantly, if you don't have relationship with Jesus Christ, we celebrate on Juneteenth freedom from slavery. Um, but what the word tells us is that whom the sun sets free receives ultimate freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from whatever it is that might have us bound. Uh, and we can have joy and peace uh, because of that freedom that is extended to us through Jesus Christ. That freedom, that liberation, that relationship comes by prayer. And, and we are happy to pray that prayer with you. So if you are looking for that kind of relationship, you can text the word CONNECT, CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, to 202-798-8927. Text CONNECT to that number, uh, and it will trigger a link, and you can fill out the information on the link there. If you're looking for a church, if you're looking for a place where you can grow, where you can pursue fulfillment and pursue that which God has for your life, um, this is a pretty cool church, I think, and I invite you to consider if God might be leading you this way. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for how it is that you minister to us. We thank you, O oh God, for how you speak to us. We thank you, O oh God, for how you show us ourselves. We thank you, O oh God, for how you reveal yourself to us. Thank you, O oh God, for our journeys. Thank you, O oh God, for uh, what's been shared tonight, God. We thank you, O oh God, for Phyllis and her story. And thank you, O oh God, that each of us has a story that each of us has a destiny, that each of us has a purpose and a calling. Pray, oh God, that you would give us a desire to pursue it vigorously. And pray, oh God, that we would discover what it is that you would have for us to learn in the process. We pray, oh God, that you would draw somebody to yourself through a, a normal everyday conversation, through a situation at work, through a circumstance that they're dealing with. Thank you that you are a God that is not too big and not too unreachable to use even the small stuff of life to get our attention and to draw us to you. So we thank you for somebody who's going to be saved as a result of a seed that's planted tonight. Pray, oh God, that you would be honored and glorified and pleased. Pray, oh God, you will watch over us and keep us until we are together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love y'all. Thank y'all so much. Thank you for joining us.